I want to uh, turn your attention to a teaching that we've been uh, that we've been sharing over the last couple of weeks, and uh, it's a sh- it's actually a, a a teaching that was given many years ago by a man named Dick Eastman. Dick Eastman, uh, for many who have been around in the body of Christ for for years, uh, is a familiar name. Uh, he is actually the president of the. Uh, I, w- I want to say it's Every Home for Christ, located in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Uh, he's uh, just a general in the faith. He is uh, just a statesman, a spiritual statesman. And uh, when I was a young man in Bible college, he came to my Bible college and he taught this, these lessons that I'm, that I'm, going, that I'm teaching you. And uh, actually, actually, a lot of what I'm teaching you is found in uh, his book, The Hour That Changes the World. Now, I have in front of me a, uh, a, a three-volume um, compilation of his works, and basically it's called Dick Eastman on Prayer, and it's, it's uh, three books in one. It's No Easy Road is his first book, sold over a million copies. Uh, the Hour That Changes the World, again, sold, sold hundreds and hundreds of thousands of copies, and then Love on Its Knees. And so uh, what I'm going to be sharing with you today are principles taken from the hour that changes the world. Now, for the past couple of weeks, we've shared how that Jesus came to his disciples and he said, what, could you not watch with me one hour? And uh, what Dick Eastman did is Dick Eastman felt that that was a revelation or a challenge from the Spirit of God to him to uh, teach people how to pray for an hour a day. And if, and if you and I could pray for an hour a day, at the end of one year, we would have 365 hours logged in. If we could take those and condense them down to eight-hour days, eight-hour working days, as if our job was prayer, we would have prayed for two and a half months as a working job. And can you imagine the power that would be unleashed if you would pray two and a half months, I would pray two and a half months, and everybody on this, on this video or on this, uh, this, this, this uh, Facebook um, prayer gathering would, if we, if we could pray for two and a half months, you think we could change the world? You think we could change a family, a city, a church, a situation? I, I know we could. And so I want to encourage you. Um, we've been talking about how... How can the average Christian who prays less than five minutes a day, how can the average pastor who prays somewhere between 15 and 20 minutes a day, how can we learn how to pray more effectively? How can we learn how to pray simply more? And uh, so what Dick Eastman did is he took the clock, the, you know, I mean, we've all seen a picture of a clock with, 12 up here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. What he did is he took the, 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 the clock and he, um, I'll make it look more like a clock. So, uh, so he took the clock and he broke it down into five minute segments. And he said, if we can learn how to pray differently for five minutes in each one of these segments, it would be much easier to pray for an hour. Because most of us, we um, kind of get lost after about 10 minutes, right? Or maybe even five minutes. We, you know, we pray for our family, we pray for our health, we pray for our job. Um, and then that's about it, right? And, and it's kind of like, okay, well, I kind of learned, you know, maybe we'll pray for our friends or, you know, we'll pray, maybe pray for our church. And, and, uh, and then after a while, it's kind of like, okay, I don't have anything more to say. Well, Talking isn't all there is to prayer. In fact, we learned that last week. We learned about waiting last week and how that waiting upon God, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And we learned that waiting upon God was silent soul surrender. One one preacher called it wordless worship. In fact, we, we saw how that David several times throughout the scripture talked about my soul waits upon the Lord. And it was in waiting upon God that God was able to come and download 
some things into David's life. Things that you and I take, take strength in today. Things that, 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 that teach us today. You know, Psalm 1 came as David was waiting upon the Lord. And what did David say? He said, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water. He'll bring forth fruit in its season. His leaf will not wither and get this, whatever he does will prosper. How did David know that? Well, he knew it by experience, but he also knew it by revelation. God had given him that revelation as he waited upon God. And if you're interested in, in, in learning how to wait upon God, get the book, read it for yourself, or look back to last week's teaching. Uh, it's been archived, and so you can look back and, uh, and you can take that teaching in. Uh, today, we're, this week, we're, we're in our third week. We're going to be teaching this for 12 weeks. And in uh, and, and the first week, we talked about praise. We talked about how uh, when we come before God, we need to enter His gates with thanksgiving and to enter His courts with praise, Psalm 100. You see, there is a divine protocol that we must engage in if we're going to enter into the presence of God. You know, if, if you and I were to have the privilege of going and meeting the Queen of England, or if we were to one day have the privilege of meeting the President of the United States, uh, you don't just enter into the presence of a king or a queen or a potentate flippantly or cavalierly, casually. No, 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 you, there, there's a protocol that you are schooled in even, even before you go in. They'll tell you. Now, as the doors are opened, you stand until you're ushered in. Then when you're ushered in, you don't come all the way in. You only walk halfway. And then, and, and I, I remember somebody who got a chance to meet the queen, they were talking about the protocol that uh, was used as uh, they were ushered into the presence of the queen. They only could walk so far. And when they walked to a certain space, if she waved them in, then they could go the rest of the way. And uh, then they would have to bow and, and so on and so forth. And so, uh, so there's, a, there's a protocol. And entering into the presence of, I'll just put this, the presence of greatness. Well, listen, we're not just entering into the presence of a king or the presence of a president or the presence of a potentate. We're, we are entering into the presence of the king of kings, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And so the Bible tells us here's how to do it. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Enter his courts with praise. And so there's a way to enter in. And the way to do it, beginning with, is to praise him, to worship him, to magnify him. That's why the Psalms are filled, because David knew the presence of God. And he knew how to enter into the presence and to attract the presence of God. And because he did, he and, and wrote it down, we can know how to attract the presence of God and enter into the presence of God as well. So the way to do it is, first of all, through praise. Now, why did we say praise? We said praise because praise takes our eyes off of self, it takes our eyes off of our circumstances, and it puts our eyes on God. Because after all, you can't do anything about your problem, I can't do anything about your problem, but God can do something about our problems, right? And so why look to ourselves? You know, it's like the old preacher said, stop telling God how big your mountains are and start telling your mountains how big your God is. See, the problem with most of us is we keep our eyes on our mountains. And as we look at our mountains, as we look at our problems, as we look at the situation, our mountains only multiply, our demons only multiply, our problems only multiply. But when we look upon God... See, see, as we look upon our mountains, our mountains get magnified. They get bigger. 
But when we look upon God, God gets bigger and our mountains get smaller. That's why the, day, that, that's why the psalmist said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. See, as we exalt him, as we magnify him, as we look to him, our mountains get smaller and our God gets bigger. And that's, that's why we enter his courts with thanksgiving. That's why we enter his courts with praise. And then last week, we talked about waiting upon God. What does it mean to wait upon God? See, we come in. We worship God. We thank God for what he's done, what he's doing, what he's going to do. We thank him for who he is. We thank him for what he's done. We, we worship him for five minutes. It's easy to worship God for five minutes. Just thank him for your health. Thank him that you can see. Thank him that you can hear. Thank him that your heart is strong. Thank him that you got a job. Thank you that you got a, him that you got a roof over your head and clothes on your back and you're sitting there and, 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 and you're not naked and, 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 uh, and out of your mind like the man who was demon possessed. But as a man who is demon possessed, you're sitting there clothed and in your right mind. Hallelujah. Right. Because I don't know about you, man. I could have been there. But Jesus redeemed me. Jesus saved me. Jesus, Jesus healed me. Jesus restored me. And so, again, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Forget not all of his benefits. He's forgiven all my iniquities. He's healed all my diseases. He's redeemed my life from destruction. You're maybe not where you want to be, but you're not where you could have been. Come on, somebody. And so he's redeemed your life from destruction. He has crowned you with loving kindness and tender mercies. Get this. David said, he satisfied my mouth with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagle. My, my, my. You know what? I've met some people that are 30 years old. 35 years old, 40 years old, living in sin, living in a sinful lifestyle, and they look like they're 60. 40 years old, they look like they're 65. I was sitting with a young man just recently, in fact, just today. I was sitting with him earlier, and he looked at me, he said, how old are you? And he guessed, and it was not as old as I am. And, uh, and I said, thank you. <laughs> He said, well, you don't look your age. I, he said, if you dyed your hair, you'd look even younger. And, uh, and so I just said, thank you, thank you. And what is that? He has satisfied my mouth with good things so that my youth is renewed like the eagles. And uh, yeah, we take, we take care of ourselves. We eat right, we exercise, we do that stuff. But it's also the blessing of God upon our lives. And so, so again, uh, we, we, we praise him. We thank him for what he's done. We thank him for what he's doing. And then we begin to wait upon the Lord. And waiting upon God is, is, is silent soul surrender. You come in and you thank him. You take that first five minutes and you worship him and you bless him. You thank him for everything that he's done. And then you, 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 you take some time and you step back. And you let him talk to you. It's kind of the, like, 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 the, like the old monks, right, in the monasteries. They didn't talk all the time when they were praying. What did they do? They sat and they listened. They focused their inner man on God. And not just their inner man focusing outward, but the Bible says, greater is he that is in you. And so, so you listen even on the inside for that voice of the Spirit of God. And then, and then as God begins to speak to you, you enter into that third, that third phase, that third part, which is confession. Now, to many Christians, that word confession is a dirty word. It's not a good word, you know, because it's like, oh, confession. You know, I got to go to a, I, got, I have to go and confess my sins to a priest, right? Or whatever it might be. Or they've heard of confession as, you know, uh, name it and claim it. Or whatever it might be. So, you know, your confession. Well, here, here's what confession means. Confession is a New Testament word, and it literally means to agree with God concerning his matter of opinion. Let me say that again. It is to agree with God concerning his matter of opinion. 
So it's whatever God says. It's not what I think. It's not my opinion. It's God's opinion. And so when I, when I find out God's opinion, if I can agree with his opinion, that's what confession is. And, and most of the time, we consider confessing as confessing our sins. Now, listen, we do need to confess our sins. The Bible says, confess your sins one to another that you may be healed, right? And so we do need to confess our sins, but it's not just about confessing our sins. It's also about confessing who we are in him. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. I am his child. I am beloved. I am the head and not the tail. And so we begin to confess. We begin to confess who we are and to agree with God's opinion concerning who we are. So as we as as we consider uh, confession uh, again, I mean, it's not just. I, it, it does have to do, you know, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And, and, and there's something important about that, you know, because, because David said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And so there is something about who shall ascend the hill of God, who shall come before his presence. He that hath clean hands, that has not lifted his soul to vanity. And so, so, so we need to cleanse our hands. We need to purify our hearts according to the scripture as we enter into his presence. And here's the thing. As we enter his courts with praise, as we wait upon him and God begins to speak to us, a lot of times our sinfulness becomes very apparent, right? I mean, I, I look in scripture and so many of the saints their sinfulness in the presence of God as they waited upon God, their sinfulness became very apparent. And in fact, uh, let, me just, let, me, let me just share a couple of those with you. Isaiah. Isaiah. Isaiah cried in chapter 6 of his book. He said, woe is me. I'm unclean. I'm an unclean man with unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of an unclean people. So Isaiah saw his sinfulness, and listen, here's what he said. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his glory filled the temple. Then he said, woe is me, for I am unclean. What was he doing? He was in the presence of God. In the presence of God, his own sinfulness became so apparent. You know, I think of Daniel. Daniel was... You know, one of, God's, one, one of God's sterling characters in the Old Testament. I mean, he was the guy who, you know, everybody was bowing. He wasn't going to bow, right? Everybody was, 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 was uh, going, going one way, and he said, man, I'm, I'm going to stand for God. And, and in fact, uh, they, they made it outlawed that, that you couldn't pray to any other God except for, you know, this other. And, and he said, man, I'm praying to God. And, and, and God alone, he prayed three times a day. They saw him praying. They threw him in the lion's den. You know the story, right? And so here's what he said. This righteous man, this man Daniel, he said, well, I was speaking and praying and confessing my sins. The sins of my people Israel. It was then that the angel Gabriel came and touched me. And so we see that Daniel, he said, man, I'm in the presence of God, and in the presence of God, I've got to confess my sin. Isaiah said, I'm unclean. When Job confessed his sins, Job was the most righteous man. The Bible says of his day. There was none like Job. In fact, the devil came in the presence of, uh, of God, and uh, what did God say? God said, you consider my servant Job. There's none like him in all the world, right? But it was when Job confessed his sins that God healed him. And God healed his, and, and uh, uh, God changed his circumstances and gave him more blessing than during his greatest days of prosperity. And so I want to encourage you. There is, there is, a, there, there is something about confessing and confessing our sins. David, David said, create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit within me. See, David cried and he said, Lord, Lord, I, I, I want your holiness. He said, God, I want your I, I want your attitude. He said, renew a right spirit within me. He said, God, God, I want your holiness. Create in me a clean heart. I want your attitude. Renew a right spirit within me. I want your guidance. Cast not me away from your presence. And then finally, he said, I, I, I want your anointing. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. You see, it's, it's, in, the, it's, in, the, it's in the waiting upon God 
Now we see our sinfulness and then confession is getting those things and giving them to God and agreeing with what God says about us. You see, sometimes we do. We just need to cleanse the temple. And uh, I, I read in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. Let me read this for you and then we're going to be done. And uh, then we're going to pray together. OK, so 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 here's what the Bible says. Second Chronicles chapter 29. It's in the days of a king by the name of Hezekiah, which was one of the great kings of the Old Testament. He said it was in those days that the priest went into the inner part of the house of God. Get that the inner part of the house of God to cleanse it and brought out all of the uncleanness that they found in the temple of the Lord into the courts of the house of the Lord. So in the days of Hezekiah, they went into the temple and they found the temple was dirty and they cleansed it out. They cleaned it out, took all the unclean things, brought it out into the courts for every, everybody to see and, 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 and clean, cleanse the temple. Well, that's the Old Testament. The New Testament says you're the temple. I'm the temple. We are the temple. And sometimes, sometimes the temple needs to be cleaned. And so if the temple needs to be cleaned, Come before the Lord, and the Bible says, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So again, as we wait upon God, as we begin by praising, as we wait, then God's going to show us some things, and as God shows us the things that He wants to show us, then we begin to confess. We begin to agree with God's opinion concerning who we are. 